All right, episode one. Let's give this a shot. Hello and welcome everyone. This is the Malthouse Games Podcast. My name is Delton Brack, and my yellow player today is my wife, Haley. Hello there. So this is a podcast made by people who love tabletop games. Uh, We're just wanting to give this podcasting a shot, and so we wanted to start up a podcast just about us playing, stories we have playing, different games we like, things like that, and just to uh, talk about tabletop games while we have a good drink. So today, this is our reboot first episode. We have scrapped the first two because they were terrible, and we've reset a little bit, so hopefully you guys will enjoy this pretty well. My name is Delton Brack. I've been playing in the board game hobby for about five years now, and it's really my main hobby. It has exploded in the back bedroom, and that's kind of where I'm coming from with tabletop games. You probably shouldn't say it exploded in the back bedroom. It's probably probably not family friendly. Well, since you said that, maybe not, but it would have been. I ruin everything. Uh-huh. You so do. Delton has been board gaming for probably about six years now. And I married into it. I've been with Delton for about five years. We were married about two and a half years ago. I love board games, but I married into it. So I had no idea what I was getting into, yet still I signed that marriage license without a prenup. Yeah, she did not realize that board games meant more than Monopoly and uh, Scrabble, you know, Battleship, things like that. I thought I was cool because I had apples to apples. I was like, nobody, like, I'm I'm a hipster. I'm good at board games. I'm the best at apples to apples, but little did I know. Yeah, she had no clue the hobby that was ahead of her that I was diving into and dragging her with me no matter how much she kicked and screamed. But five years later, and here I am winning about 75% of the time. Yeah, she wins a lot. Moving on. uh, So I want to talk about one small thing, which every episode we're going to try to be having a drink. Part of the name of this podcast is the Malt House Games. So Malt House comes from two things. One, it comes from my love of beer. I'm a home brewer, so I make beer at home. I make mead, which is a honey wine, and so I drink a lot of beers from different companies and everything. So today, even though it's in a Schlafly glass, which is a St. Louis brewery, uh, I am drinking Arrogant Bastard Ale by Stone Brewery. It is a nice, hoppy, a little bit heavy ale, uh, 7.2% alcohol by volume. Very good. I don't know that it's the best for the hot summer months, being that this is August in Oklahoma, but uh, it's delicious, and that's what I'm drinking today. You chose poorly. Uh I am a big beer drinker myself, and I love to try different beers with Delton. Every time we go to a new state, we always try different breweries, and we'll normally get a flight or two and just split them to try everything. For some reason, I have this thought in me that if I drink anything other than beer, I'm a sissy. I don't know if this is my trying to break against the stereotype of the female, but every time I want to have like a fruity mixed drink, I always feel like I am lame or that I am weak sauce. But tonight I am breaking that and I am having half Sprite, half pineapple juice, and a shot of purity vodka. Now, I was thinking about this Hard liquor has more alcohol content than beer generally. Yes, it does. So I don't understand why beer is considered the manly drink whenever the liquor will get you effed up quicker than anything. I honestly have no idea. I mean, honestly, it probably leads back to before Prohibition, when that's what the working men drank until it was outlawed. And so I don't know if it just women didn't drink it, even though, you know, Guinness used to have advertisements, pregnant women drink a Guinness a day. I really have no idea where that comes from, but it's a stereotype we have, although... You know, liquor's always delicious as well. So about this vodka I'm drinking, it's called Purity Vodka. And I just want to say, I've been spending the last two years searching from coast to coast for this vodka. Delton's been saying he has been wanting it for a couple years now. And so whenever I traveled without him, like, say to Las Vegas, Las Vegas has every liquor you can imagine. But for some reason, I could not find Purity in any liquor stores. So I pretty much gave up on it. Delton said he could only find it on a few coastal cities, so I really stopped looking. But then we go to Indianapolis for Gen Con. We go into a Kroger. A Kroger. I have been to hotels all over Vegas looking for this stuff. And I go to a Kroger in the outskirts of many, of Indianapolis. And lo and behold, I find a bottle of Purity Vodka. So that is what I am drinking tonight in my pineapple and Sprite. And I am damn proud I finally found it. But in the middle of a Kroger in Indianapolis. Why? Yeah, it's a Swedish vodka that apparently is very highly award winning. 
And so I always wanted it, and we just got super lucky. But talking about a little bit about Gen Con at least segues me into bringing this back to board games away from alcohol, acting like we're alcoholics. Um, the other part of why I call it Malt House Games is because there is a card in Agricola that is the Malt House. Strictly because I like that card, and I like Agricola, so there you go. And he likes beer. I also like beer a lot. So to keep on to the game side of this, so like I said, I've been playing board games for five to six years now, so I have a very large collection. I want to say it's 184? 86? Something like that, not including the trade pile. 180 shit done. Yes, exactly. And so we play a lot of games. Um, some of my favorites are Dominant Species, I've been a really big fan of Sagrada lately and Flamme Rouge. We've been playing some ghost stories and custom heroes, a little bit of Hive. So kind of all over the board, really. King Domino. We've been playing King Domino a little bit as well. King Domino. Yep. I'm Gotta have that French accent on it. I'm convinced that's how it said because that's how the creator said it. That's how Bruno said it, yeah. But we play games all the time. And so, like I said, Sagrada's been one I've loved lately. The stained glass dice drafting, just super fun game, super puzzly. Everybody has a good time so far with that one. So it's a really simple game. You have a board in front of you that is a stained glass window, and you get a card that gets inserted into it, making that grid different colors and values of the dice. So then what you do is you go down the line, picking dice of different values and colors, placing them in that on the certain spots they're supposed to be, and there are different restrictions, like up and down and left and right, so orthogonally, you cannot place two colors next to each other of the same of the same color next to each other, and you can't place the same value next to each other, but diagonal's okay. So you draft these dice, you try to fill your board up as best as possible, then there are three goals on the board, you want to try to match those and get points, and whoever has the most points at the end wins, nice and simple. At the beginning of the game, by like the first half or so, you're having a lot of fun, like this is easy, I can put this dice here, put this dice here, oh man, I'm going to win this game. Then the second half of the game, you start cussing a lot. Because all of a sudden, all of those empty spots are restricted by the die next to them. And you are cursing every fiber of your being. Of a, Why did I pick this pattern? Why did I do this? I'm going to fail miserably. And then sometimes you still win. Yeah, that's true. The patterns uh, have different difficulties from 3 to 6. And what that means is a 3, 4, 5, or 6, you get certain little tokens which you can use special abilities on. And so the cool part is, yes, it's a puzzle, but unlike a normal puzzle, where it starts out very difficult and then it gets easier, this one starts out very easy and then just gets extremely difficult, to where sometimes you never finish your window, which gives you negative points. But you can still win with that. You could still win with that, yes. I also want to talk about Santorini. This was one of my new favorites. This was a Kickstarter game that we didn't pick it up as a Kickstarter, we picked it up afterward, which we'll get into here in a little bit. But basically, you are acting as Greek gods and goddesses, building the uh, structures that make up the island of Santorini. So the island of Santorini in Greece is what you see in a lot of picturesque photos of these tall white buildings with these blue domes on top. And basically, you're acting as Greek gods and goddesses, building up these domes, or building up these towers, and you want to build it up to three levels and be the first god or goddess on top of it. And if you are, then you win. The thing is that others can cap your building before you make it to the top, which that means that you can't stand on top of it and you can't be the goddess or god of everything. Yeah, it's sort of an abstract game, uh, chess-like. As she said, she described it well. You move your person, you build a building. If you get onto the third level without it being capped, you win. Uh, the cool part is everybody gets a power in the game. So instead of just being everyone moves one and plays one, or moves one and builds one, I should say, they will move two and build one, or... They will move any number as long as they don't move up a level and then build one. And there's just all kinds of combinations. There's like 50. I was Aphrodite, I think, the second time we played. And so whenever you're Aphrodite, which you should never forget that I am your Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. I am your goddess as well. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, if I got close to one of Delton's figures uh, as Aphrodite, then his figures could not be more than one space away from me. So if I moved, they had to follow. Yeah, it was super brutal. I mean, just I couldn't go too far with different people. I think that power would be amazing in a four-player game. The game works best at two, I think, but with four players, that could be awesome because you could just keep people next to you, and then you could utilize what they're building, which is really cool. With three-player, we both got our asses handed to us by our friend Allison. Yeah, she had a strong power, though, that's for sure. She won twice in a row, though. 
Yeah, that's a good point. But the cool part is, so Santorini and Sag- Sagrada both are new to our collection. Uh, as is King Domino, Flamme Rouge. King Domino. King Domino. And Custom Heroes. We also picked up Century Gollum Edition, which is the same game as Century Spice Road, but amazing new artwork. Instead of cubes, they're little crystals. Just absolutely fantastic. Uh, we also finally picked up Two Rooms and a Boom. Sorry, there's the cat in the background. Every time you hear a cat meow, you take a drink. Those at home. Yeah, it's a pretty good rule. Uh, we picked up Deception Murder in Hong Kong, Lorenzo Il Magnifico, Millennium Blades, Letters from Whitechapel, and a couple other small games. But the good thing is, we didn't just pick these up, we didn't just order from Amazon. We bought these at the place that is our topic of this episode. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. Gen Con. Yes, Gen Con. This was Gen Con 50 in 2017. Absolutely, 100% the best vacation I've probably been on aside from our honeymoon. It was me and 65,999 other Deltons. Yeah, they haven't released, uh, released the official numbers yet. I do know, I looked it up today, that they had 207,000, almost 208,000 unique entries into the doors. So each, well, I guess not unique, when each person comes in, even if they leave and come back, 208,000, which is insane. I just want to say that a board game convention is probably the only place you're able to go where the men's bathroom line is longer than the women's. Keep this in mind, I was there with 66,000 other people, and the most women I ever saw in the bathroom were three. (laughs) And there were multiple times I had to wait to use a restroom. But for anyone listening... Gen Con is absolutely amazing. I highly recommend going. It, it has... We returned earlier this week, so it has only been a couple days, actually. And I'm already scheduling for 2018. It's just that fantastic of a convention. Absolutely amazing. So, for anybody who's into tabletop games, Gen Con is the place to go. And being that this is the topic of this episode, we're going to go into it with a little more detail. So, let's talk about the trip up first. I don't know what it is about... The men in my life. I'm not trying to stereotype or generalize to genders by any means. But this has been a common theme with my dad, my grandfather, my other grandfather, my great-grandfather, my uncle, my husband, my husband's brother, and just about every other male I have traveled with. Where whenever they want to leave for a car trip, we leave at like 2 or 3 in the morning. I don't understand that. Why? Why is that? All the women... Always complain. My mom complained. I sure as hell complained whenever we left for Gen Con at 3 in the morning. But Delton's reason was that we're going to beat traffic going into Tulsa. So if we leave at 3 o'clock in the morning, then we'll be going through Tulsa probably about 5 or 6. So we beat the rush hour traffic. But my rationale was that though we're beating Tulsa traffic, we're making it just in time to Springfield traffic. To which Delton replied, shut the hell up. No, the reasoning, which you don't seem to catch on to, is not that you're beating rush hour traffic. It's that there is no traffic between 3 and about 6 to 6.30 in the morning. The highways are empty, so you're driving for 3 to 4 hours with nobody out there with you. Which means you can run a little bit quicker on the highway, and you don't have to worry with traffic and stopping and passing and all that. And so we made it all the way to Springfield without dealing with any traffic up until we got close to Springfield. There's no traffic, but there's a greater increase in stress. I wouldn't say stress, just exhaustion all around, because that convention (laughs) is exhausting. Oh, it is. It's so fun, but it's so exhausting. It really is. So the trip up for us, uh, Google Maps will tell you 10 and a half to 11 hours. The trip up for us, it's about 730 miles, was about 16 hours, just because we had to stop, go to the restroom, stop, grab something to eat, stop and have lunch. You know, stop and get gas. Everything you end up stopping for adds so much more time. Plus all the construction. We are probably sitting in traffic for a good hour outside of Illinois. I want to say it was later in Illinois, just outside Indiana. That day was a whole, that was just a blur. I mean, I was so sleep deprived. I don't even remember which states we crossed through at what times. Yeah, it was just exhausting. But the trip up there is tiring. I would have liked to have flown, but flying is obviously far more expensive. Where driving, you just pay for gas, uh, and it makes it a lot easier. You can kind of relax, trade off drivers if you want, things like that. I think we only spent about $110 on gas for the whole trip. 
Yeah, luckily my car gets about 30 miles to the gallon highway. So that made it a lot nicer. So our first day was that Tuesday we drove up. Then Wednesday was the start of Gen Con. No, we drove up Wednesday morning. Oh. Early Wednesday morning we drove up. We arrived Wednesday night about 6.30. Like I said, that day was very tiring, kind of a blur. <laughs> so the day we arrived, we got some Thai food near our hotel. Um, I'll talk about the hotels first because it's near impossible to get a hotel downtown Indianapolis without spending between four and $600 a night. These are the hotels that have uh, skywalks directly into the convention center. So instead of driving like we did, we had to drive 30 minutes through the town or 30 on the highway. We discovered the town was actually faster than that, and we got to drive through basically the ritzy part of town with nice houses, so that was cool. But the hotels downtown are expensive. They're hard to get. They don't have free breakfast. Our hotel was about $180 a night. Free breakfast, even though for both of us being almost completely vegan, they had cheese and far too much. But the breakfast was still free, and the hotel was actually awesome, and it had a kitchen, so if we wanted to cook anything and save a little money, we could. And they had cocktails. They did. They had some sort of meetups Monday through Thursday, and it was like a free drink or two, something like that. Yeah. Can't complain about that. So the first day was obviously travel. We got in probably about 7 o'clock at night and then just died for 10 hours. The next day, Delton wanted to be at Gen Con a few hours early so that we could make our spot in line. So we arrived at Gen Con probably about two hours early. We parked about 7.30. So this is the most Gen Con experience in the world. We came up to the Indianapolis Convention Center looking for a parking spot on the very first day. And lo and behold, crossing the street right in front of us was Tom Vassell and a red fedora. So for anybody listening, you likely know Tom Vassell from the Dice Tower. Uh, found out he's six foot four, so he is a very tall man, and he always has a fedora on. We should expect that by now if you watch uh, anything on YouTube. He has many phases of his life. The first phase is wherever he wore just a tie and a button-down shirt and stood very awkwardly and didn't make direct eye contact with the camera. The second phase of his life was whenever he started wearing t-shirts. Then the third phase whenever he added in the fedoras. Yep, so he's in fedora phase now. Um, actually, very nice guy from the little interaction I had with him. Oh, he was very nice. I And I enjoyed his live taping of his podcast, too, which we should get into. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, but we saw him crossing the street, so that was our very first Gen Con thing that happened at all. We were like, man, these crowds are crazy, people everywhere. And then Haley goes, oh my god, that's Tom Vassell. Holy shit, that's Tom Vassell. And I was like, wait, what? And I looked. Sure enough, he's crossing the street along with Sam Healy, one of the other Dice Tower guys. And Z. I didn't see Z. Z was there. I think he's in the picture. Maybe so. I just didn't. I guess I didn't notice him. But they were crossing the street. So that was really cool. So for me, instantly, I kind of fanboyed for a second because why wouldn't you? And we started singing the song. You all at home sing along. Top vessel, top one, high jack games of all time. <laughs> so we always sing that as a joke because it's hilarious. We think that song is uh, a little too goofy and cheesy, but it he, works. He sings it because he knows it annoys the hell out of his wife. Well, that as well. So that was our first experience there about 7.30 to 8 o'clock in the morning. So we roll in, find parking, luckily in a parking garage, about a block and a half from the convention center. We get into the convention center, and there is a ton of people already. And so we start waiting in line until 10 o'clock. And finally, 10 o'clock rolls around after chatting with some people next to us, sweating far too much in that small space. It smelled like boy in there. Yeah, majority of the people were men. That's, I mean... Our de- the demographic is, li- uh, demographic is like white male 25 to 40. It's very obvious that that's the, the main connoisseur of tabletop games, I guess is a way to put it. Finding a woman the first day of Gen Con. The other days, you know, the other three days there's going to be more females. With the very first day of Gen Con, whenever the vendor hall opens, finding a woman is like finding Where's Waldo the day he decides to change his shirt. I mean, it was almost that bad, yeah. But the best part, Gen Con, which I think is the coolest part of Gen Con, It's by far that vendor hall. I mean, you walk through doors, and there's booth after booth after booth. After booth after booth. Exactly. Advertisements everywhere, games everywhere, people everywhere. Absolutely fantastic. It's like walking into a Walmart, but every single aisle is board games and tabletop games and role-playing games, a few video games, things like that. And you elbow people all day long. Yes, fighting the crowds is definitely not very easy, but extremely enjoyable. So we got in, and obviously I'm awestruck, just looking around, really enjoying where we're at. 
I'm realizing I should have invested in a child's lease for my husband because I almost lose him probably about eight times. Not only because he's finding so many good deals and finding so many things he wants to look at, but also because there's about 30,000 people who look just like him with red beards. Yes, I was not the only ginger with a beard uh, at the convention, that's for sure. But it was, I mean, it was just absolutely fantastic walking around. Our first game we purchased was Century Gollum Edition. I wanted to be one of the first 50 people this year who could get it for free. But I guess some of the uh, VIG, very important gamer uh, pass holders, stood in line. I offered to get into an old-fashioned street brawl for them to fight for my husband's honor and the board game, but he said no. (laughs) Well, they had enough to sell, so that was fine. Um, Awesomely, uh, Emerson Matsuchi, the creator of the game, actually was there to sign them. So that was fantastic, getting that signed. So that was my first other, I guess my second experience at Gen Con. We met so many designers there. Did you know, what's the guy's name who made King Domino? Uh, Bruno Cathala. Bruno Cathala looks just like Vladimir Lenin. And I can say now that I got a picture taken with Vladimir Lenin. (laughs) He does resemble him a little too much. Google Vladimir Lenin, then Google Bruno Cathala. Oh my god, they are twins. I believe that he was reincarnated into a board game designer. He didn't get it right (laughs) the first time trying to uh, lead the Bolshevik Revolution, so he had to try again. Mm Mm-hmm. But it was really cool because we got Emerson for Century to sign the game. We got Bruno Cathala and the artist of King Domino to sign it. Uh, What else did we get signed? We got Custom Heroes signed by the creator. We got Eric Eric Lang's signature. There you go. Eric Lang's signature twice, actually. Uh, We got the creator of Billionaire Banshee. Matt Fantastic, who made Come Together. Yep, we got him to sign our copy of Come Together. Um, We got... Alan and Sean from Two Rooms and a Boom to sign, or from, sorry, from Tuesday Night Games to sign Two Two Rooms and a Boom, their game. I just want to throw a shout out to Alan and Sean and a little to SBJ as well, because they are absolutely awesome. So I listened to the Tuesday Night Podcast, which is Alan and Sean, and SBJ was on there for the first, you know, 80 or so episodes. He was on there as the main host. Absolutely some of the greatest guys. I actually recorded a small story and submitted it because they were asking for submissions of stories from viewers, or I guess listeners. And luckily, my story was actually chosen for episode number 90. I want to say, yeah, episode 90. And so, in, since they're the Tuesday nights, they always say that their listeners are the Tuesday knaves. So what they do is they knight anybody who's on the podcast, so your story counts. So I think I was the only knight that showed up at Gen Con. There's only about five or six people that have submitted stories, but that was really cool to meet them. You know, tell them I'm a knight and which one it was and sit and talk to them. We went to their live podcast, which was absolutely fantastic. We got three free games, which was really cool. Again, we got their signatures. We got to play uh, a game with them, kind of play test a creation of Alan's. You mad, bro. We got to play you mad, bro, which is Matt Fantastic's design, and they're going to publish it. So they're doing kind of early stage play testing right now. I want to have a beer with Matt Fantastic. Well, we went to see his booth and he was the first day whenever I bought the game from he was dressed as Snow White the second day he was dressed as a sexy nurse and he created a game called come together which is basically a game where you where couples play so romantic partners play together and it lists out different acts or things you can do in the bedroom with your partner doesn't it's not something you have to do but it's ideas and you go through and you choose your favorites and you try and guess your partner's favorites. And the object of the game is if you you and your partner both pick the same favorite uh, two times in a row, then you both win. And you can try it out. But the his rule book has a big paragraph on consent. This does not mean that you have to do these things. This is just an idea to get couples to start talking and get themselves comfortable with one another. And he just sounds like the coolest guy. I'm a I'm a therapist and like I would recommend that to couples. Definitely. Yeah, it's a really cool. We actually played it just for the fun of it, just to kind of you know feel it out. And it's a really neat game. And I think in a therapeutic uh, environment, on a couple that's having issues in the bedroom or having uh, marital issues being well, communication connected, communication issues. It's really yeah. good just for communication. That's very true. Uh, it would definitely work in something like that. So that was really cool. Matt Fantastic was an awesome guy. Uh, we also, even though we didn't get his signature, we got to meet uh, Isaac Vega from Plaid Hat Games, who he's the creator of Dead of Winter as well as Ashes: Rise of the Phoenix Born. Super nice guy. We, like, we just went up to shake his hand and say, Hey, we love Dead of Winter. We love your games. And he ended up showing us all around his booth and showing us his new games that he has coming out. Very kind guy. Very awesome guy. And I can't wait to hopefully one day drive down to Dallas and play some games with him. Yeah, so Plaid Hat Games, I guess every once in a while, I think it's once a month or something, 
um, they do a game day at their facility, and so I really want to drive down or take a train. That would be cool to take a train since it's not too long. Uh, down and go play. But yeah, Isaac Vega was extremely nice. Super awesome guy. His new game, uh, he just had artwork for it. Kind of prototype art, I think. Which was really cool. Very Gundam-esque. Um, but he was kind of explaining it to us. And it sounds like it would be awesome. All of the board game designers were nice. I mean, I, I kind of forced my way up to get Eric Lang's signature. And he was even super nice about it. Yeah, we went up to uh, get in line for Eric Lang. And there was a decent line for it. And so... We were just going to playtest something real quick because there was a short game uh, just while we waited. So we went to go playtest, and next thing we know, the playtest is over, and we look up, and nobody's in line. And I guess they were closing it down, and Haley sneaks in and says, We're big fans of your games. Can we please have an autograph? And luckily, the people at the Cool Mini or Not booth, the ones working it, did not kick us out, and they let us get a signature on a Blood Rage little photo as well as a Rising Sun photo. So that was really cool. Eric Lang was nice as well. He was super nice, and I absolutely love his games. Yep, he's really good. Um, but there was a lot of people. Like I said, we got, uh, I can't think of his name, John D. Clare, that did Custom Heroes from AEG. Mm-hmm. He also made um, Mystic Veil. Vale. Mystic Veil, vale. yeah. But he was super nice. Uh, we met him, had him sign our game. Uh, we played it, which that's a very, very fun game. I highly recommend that. Just meeting all the designers at Gen Con and all the publishers and being able to talk to people. I got to meet Lindsay Road, who's a small designer that is has been featured on the Tuesday Night Podcast. Um, I got to meet, like I said, SBJ. I got to meet Will Anderson, who is B-Team Will from Tuesday Night Podcast, but he's on the Pokemon Podcast with SBJ. I got to meet SBJ's friend Micah, who's on the Carve Podcast. So just all kinds of people. Vladimir Lennon, like I said. Yep, Bruno Cathala and the artist of King Domino. And then we also got to meet Z Garcia at the Secret Cabal meetup. Yeah, it was really cool because he was a super nice guy too, very chill. And then later that night, we got to meet Rodney Smith from Watch It Played, another YouTube series, who he was awesome. Definitely Canadian. And then the last one we met that night was actually Jamie from The Secret Cabal, which Jamie is like the main, you know, forerunner of The Secret Cabal podcast. So that's an, again, you can hear all the podcasts I listen to are the ones I'm talking about here or videos on YouTube, but just awesome. Secret Cabal had a meetup, like 1,200 people showed up. Everyone's just drinking, having a good time. I definitely drank. You definitely drank. We got to talk to uh, Stephen Bonacore, owner of Stronghold Games, at the Stronghold booth. We talked to him a couple of times. He we ran a, into him here and there. He was a really nice guy. He really was, and he sold us Flam Rouge, so that was awesome. He did, and he's a, he was the only one at the Secret Cabal meetup who was drinking wine. Like, everyone else had, like, these plastic solo cups filled with beer, and you see him waltzing around with a glass of wine like a classy gentleman. Oh, uh, it was great. But uh, aside from meeting everybody at Gen Con, the cool part is, too, you get a demo a lot. So we didn't demo too much. Uh, we demoed Lorenzo Il Magnifico, which is Simon's one of their Euro games, which I did pick up because it's absolutely fantastic. Crazy Cat Lady. We demoed Crazy Cat Lady, which we did not pick up yet. We will pick up. It was so- I thought about picking it up the fourth day, but then it was sold out. Yeah, it sold out like end of the third day, I think. Yeah. And then we picked up Custom Heroes pretty early, which is one that we got to demo. Um, I'm trying to think what else we demoed. We demoed You Mad Bro at the Tuesday Night Games booth. We looked at Lisboa. Now, you had a horrible headache during Lisboa, which is very unfortunate, but that game is a beast of its own. That was intense. But luckily, I checked out, uh, don't tell the company, but checked out Cool Stuff, Inc. It's only, I believe, 70 rather than the 100 they ask retail. Oh my gosh, really? So that's, I mean, that's a 30% discount just being Cool Stuff, so that's something I'll have to check out because I really want to play that game. So here's 90% of our conversations at Gen Con. Here's Delton. Hey, Haley, should I buy X game? Well, Delton, says Haley. I think you've bought X number of games already, haven't you? Shouldn't we wait? Delton, why don't you let me live my life? Why don't you love me? That's pretty accurate. <laughs> and so I tried to get him to wait on Lisboa because the very first day he's like, I just want to buy it. Like, you haven't play tested yet? It's also a hundred friggin' dollars. That's just a lot. The most I spent on a game was 80, which was Millennium Blades. And I've been eyeballing that game on Amazon almost every day for like two months. Watching the price, seeing if it drops below 60. So I paid 20 bucks more at the con. But here's my reasoning for purchasing at the convention at the full price through the cre- like uh, publishers of the games. So Millennium Blades is from Level 99 Games. My main concern was I'm giving them the money, not the distributor, not the retail shop they're selling through. It's going directly to them. So I won't, don't mind spending a little bit more on my games if I'm giving the money to the people who make them. I just feel like that's a best, the best way to support them. Uh, it helps keep the, you know, 
the whole hobby alive a little bit. It's also the best way to support your instant gratification. That's also a very good point. But, I mean, aside from games, there were booths with just tons of dice, booths with all kinds of card sleeves and t-shirts. They had some real weird, like, anime weeb stuff going on. Chainmail bikinis. Chainmail bikinis, all kinds of cosplay. There were so many people, like, you you live your life how you want to. I'm a big fan of cosplay. I'm a big fan of dressing up. Like, you let your freak flag fly. I mean, I used to have a purple mohawk, so I'm down. But there are so many people wearing dog collars. I was so confused. There's just a lot of stuff goes on with cosplay. I mean, people do anything they want to, which that's the cool part about cosplay. That really is. I mean, I was impressed by some of those costumes. Like, there was one girl who had a costume that was basically a combination between Belle and Pikachu. That was yeah. amazing! Yeah, they have some really cool stuff. Um, aside from cosplay and aside from the vendor hall, which was definitely my favorite part, aside from meeting everybody, I guess. Uh, they also, the Lucas Oil Stadium, which is the Colts, Indianapolis Colts football stadium. The entire field was taken over by nerds, which was awesome. I stood on the 50-yard line. I am the closest thing my family will ever get to an athlete. Yeah, exactly, for both of us. Uh, the 50-yard line had a museum, which had some different, like, old board games from way back when. It had handwritten notes from Gary Gygax himself, which he is, I guess, the co-creator slash creator of Dungeons and Dragons, as well as Gen Con. Is he the co-creator of Dungeons and Dragons? Yes, they originally uh, created it on his porch. Really? I had yep. no idea. Yep, so that's, I mean, that's, his fame is not just Gen Con, his fame is D&D. Wow. And so seeing, you know, those are notebooks with his handwritten notes and stuff, which is just really awesome to have. So that was a cool museum. They had a an, an entire rental library that you take a couple generic tickets and get in, rent a game, play it, that's fun. And then the Mayday Fair, Mayday Fair? Mayday, uh, Mayday Mayfair game. Games. I can never get that right. Mayfair Games had a booth of rentals, which was cool. We got to play Baron Park, which is not quite as good as Patchwork, but still very good. Freaking love Patchwork, though. I'll make me a quilt all day and kick your ass doing it. Yeah, every time. But it's just really neat, because then we, we did the Colts Field. We walked around a lot. We had some different events. We knitted, terribly knitted, I guess, crocheted cat toys. Mine was mouse-like. Mine looked like a little pig with like a misshapen body. Uh, we went on a ghost tour one night with someone who got some history wrong, but all in all, it was interesting. We, what else did we do? Live podcast, another live podcast. We bought tickets to the burlesque show, but I got too drunk at the secret, se- secret, secret cabal, cabal meetup. Meet yep. Haley drank too much. We had to sit in the car and wait for me to sober up to drive, and then she just fell asleep. I got some pretty good fi- pictures of her asleep with her mouth open, which was awesome. God, I'm ugly. Why'd you marry me? That's fine. Uh, but, I mean, the events are awesome. There's all kinds of rooms where you just go play. I mean, just huge spaces, tons of people playing games everywhere, whether it's an RPG, a board game, a card game, tournaments. I mean, there's stuff you could do every single hour of the day at Gen Con if you wanted to. Not to mention, there's some pretty good food around. P.F. Chang's did save our life, as did that little noodle stand that had the vegan option. Was it Island Noodle? I think it was Island Noodles or Island Noodle. Oh my god, they're fantastic. They had chicken option and vegan option. That was it. And they served you quick and they served you right. And then they had the Sun King Brewery, who made a Gen Con beer. They had a little stand set up. Food trucks every day outside. Little coffee shop across the street. Multiple restaurants downtown. Just really awesome. I mean, anything you wanted to do at Gen Con, you can do at Gen Con. So it was four days just jam-packed. We went to the con every single day. And we were there probably about until 30 minutes until it closed on Sunday. And then we made our way home on Monday. So Monday was August 21st, which was the day of the eclipse. And the route we were traveling home just so happened to put us in the zone of totality. So we actually, we didn't have glasses or anything, so we really didn't plan on looking at the eclipse. We were driving through the middle of Missouri, and all of a sudden, within this 45-second span, it goes from 1.30 in the afternoon light to dusk, dark. And we're like, oh my god, this is so crazy. So we open the sunroof, and there it is in totality, the eclipse. And I smacked Delton and said, Delton, look up, and he got to see it as well. And so we took turns, you know, looking up and seeing it until the sun started peeking out, and we didn't go blind. Yeah, which is very which good. Which is very good. <laughs> you, NASA said that you can look at the full eclipse whenever it is in the zone of totality. If you're in the zone of totality, if it's a full eclipse, you can look at it with the naked eye and be fine. Mm-hmm. And we can both vouch that neither one of us are blind. Yep, we listen to NASA. And as soon as the sun started peeking out, we looked away. But it was the most awe-inspiring, amazing thing I'd ever seen. I mean, it was really awesome. We were just going through St. Louis, just outside of St. Louis, which is where a lot of people were stopped. 
The highways were completely empty, except for one or two vehicles and us. And then that's when it started getting kind of dark. Looked like it was going to be stormy, maybe cloudy. Then it just got dark enough. The street lights came on. My car's lights automatically came on. We were like, we have to look now or else we might not see this. So it was just really cool to see the eclipse on the way back. That's kind of a good, you know, good way to top off a, uh, a giant Gen Con trip of purchasing and game playing and people meeting and all that good stuff. Then we got stuck in all the traffic because there were hundreds of cars from all over the country in this spot. And it was ridiculous. By St. Louis. And so it took us about 17 and a half hours to make that 11 hour trip again. Oh, it was so brutal. But it was very much worth it. And I have to tell you, if your marriage can survive a 17 hour car ride, you can survive anything. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. Our marriage made it just fine. My back, on the other hand, not quite so much. You drink to marriage in your back. We will drink to that. <laughs> but all in all, Gen Con is awesome. I highly recommend it. I know we've just kind of blabbered about what we got to do and who we got to see in sort of bra- in a in a braggadocious way, but hopefully that gets you excited about it. Hopefully you can listen to us talking about it and say that sounds fantastic. I mean the passes were like ninety five dollars for a four day, which is not that bad. The hard part is the hotel, but if you've got a couple friends willing to split a hotel room, do four people with two queen beds or a spouse or a spouse, either way, it would be fine. It's not that bad. And here's the thing, like, I love board games. They're so much fun. But I'm not as big of a board game nerd as Delton. Like, Delton, this is his dream trip. But even me, who's just like a, a fun, this is fun board games, I just enjoy them on the side. I had an absolute blast. And board games aren't my life like they are Delton's. I, I love them and I had fun. So if you're just on the fence like, oh, I don't know if I'm, you know, want to go to Gen Con. I don't know if I can do four ga- days of board games. You can do four days of board games and knitting cat toys and going on ghost tours and drinking beer. Do it. Do it. It's so fun. It really is a blast, which, like I said, we're planning for 2018 already. Uh, I've been scoping out hotels a little bit. I might have to do the Very Important Gamer. It's way expensive. It's like $600 for a pass. But the fact you get a downtown hotel with a skywalk, no more 30-minute driving, no more $22 parking, I mean, that would save us at least a little bit. The problem is we'd have to buy breakfast. So that's just something we'll consider Up until the passes go on sale in January. To be continued. Yeah, to be continued on that. Uh, So I guess that brings together the topic. I mean, that was quite a long uh, blabbering section of that, but I think that's okay. Hopefully you enjoyed listening to that. Uh, The last thing we want to end on is for each of our episodes, we always want to do a topic like that, uh, given we'll do something not so crazy next time. This will probably be a little bit longer episode than what we were aiming for. However, we want to end... Well, something small, but something interesting. So what we're going to do is at the end of every episode, we're going to do some sort of question. We'll come up with a name for this segment in the future. We'll come up with an introduction to it, kind of like we have for our topic section. Uh, But for now, it's just going to be a question. And so the question we came up with that we thought would be very interesting is what past, I guess, currently dead person would you want to play a board game with? And what board game would that be? So Haley, what would you decide on? I decided on Hunter S. Thompson. So, for you all who don't know who Hunter S. Thompson is, I hate you. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But he is my favorite author of all time. He is the author of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, a book I have read multiple times, including on the Las Vegas Strip. I sat outside the Flamingo and read the book one afternoon, and it was phenomenal. But he is my favorite author, and if you're used to his writing style of Reddit, he is a the founder of Gonzo Journalism, which is basically you immerse yourself into the event and you're still writing about it from an outsider's perspective, but you're drunk and witnessing it the whole time. So it's basically a a narration of the news event rather than just covering it. So he wrote for things like Rolling Stone and other popular magazines in the 60s and 70s. And like I said, his most famous book is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which he's had many others like Fear and Loathing and America and The Great Shark Hunt and all sorts of fun stuff. But I would want to play a board game with him. But there are two board games I would play. One, I guess, would be Fiasco. So Fiasco is a role-playing game. It's a one-shot. It takes about two to three hours. Definitely. Uh, Basically, you roll your dice, you get your character, and you're playing... You can play like a Tarantino movie, really. Yeah, just like a 90s film, yeah. It's like a 90s film. And so you might be a drug dealer, you might be an office worker, but you just... It's all based on your relationships with one another. And you act out scenes as you go. There's act one, act two, like a twist where everything starts to come together, and then a finale where everything, all the loose ends are tied up. 
But I think with his style of writing and his style of narration and journalism, this is personality absolutely fun to play with that. On the other hand, I would also like to get him good, drunk, and drugged up and play something like Ticket to Ride. Something basic, something kind of silly and childish, but just to watch his reactions. Because I think that even he would find a way to make that sarcastic and make it make it adult. I can see that. I mean, just I've never read the books, but I've seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and The Rum Diaries and those kind of movies of his. I mean, I can see with the kind of character that he's always portrayed as being someone that would be great for something like Fiasco especially. I tell you, I fell in love with Delton multiple times before I got married to him. But one of the ways that I fell in love with him was our very first Valentine's Day together. He bought me a bowl of popcorn and we sat and watched Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. That's when I knew that he was the one. Yep, that works for me. So in terms of me, I'm going to break this rule. I'm going to pick two people. One of which, though, will be a second for both of us. It's okay, I broke the rule too. I picked one person with two games. That's true. So I think something that would be absolutely amazing is I want to play Arkham Horror the card game, the LCG, with H.P. Lovecraft. I think seeing someone as smart as him, but as odd as him, play something influenced by his own work. I think that would just be, I mean, absolutely fantastic. He had weird ideas, wrote weird stories, was a very peculiar guy. He'd probably be socially awkward during the whole thing, though. He probably would, but at the same time, I mean, if you take someone that, he only lived till 40, I believe, and to take someone like that and play a game that they wrote the origins of that game, technically. Everything in that game is based off of his creation. I just would love to see the reaction to that. And I think he's honestly one of the few people that have that. I mean, there's not many other authors out there that you can look at a game and go, oh, this is based off this author. I mean, Lovecraft is the one. Now, given everything he has, his IP is public. So nobody has claim to Cthulhu. Anybody can use it. So that definitely helps with why there's so much Cthulhu and Lovecraft mythos out there. But I think that would be amazing. Now, for the cheating aspect here... The one I think both of us would think which was cool is to play Netrunner with Isaac Asimov, a game about futuristic cyberpunk corporations running things with hackers going Matrix style in. I mean, that's Isaac Asimov, for those who don't know, wrote iRobot and The Foundation and a bunch of other sci- sci fi novels. Series. If you haven't read The Foundation series, Oh my gosh, stop what you're doing right now. Stop this podcast and go read them right now. Actually, don't stop this podcast. It's probably almost over and this is a good podcast. Yeah, it's almost done. Hang on. Uh, But Isaac Asimov wrote these stories and it was about how in the future there will be robots. The robots do the manual labor and people use their brains for stuff. But it all has that, that AI slight morality to it element of just, you know, futuristic robots. Are they real? Are they alive? Can they break the laws made? Just like an iRobot, you know, they can't harm a human, blah, blah, blah. Just seeing him play something like Netrunner, that's a card game you're using your brain on, but it's all focused on this future of technology and corporations ruling with that technology and then hackers breaking in. And I just think that's a neat theme that he might be able to grasp on and say, this is cool. He was the one who coined the term robotics. I don't know if you knew that. It was before... Robotics was even a thing. He coined the term robotics for his stories. And whenever robotics, actual science and technology, like the study of it, came about, they used the term to define what they were doing, which he thought was pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. But I think he would be like our both of our secret thing. I have not read the books, but I think with what you've told me about them and having watched iRobot and stuff, I think that would be fun to play Netrunner with Asimov. Yeah, oh, it would be fantastic. Smart idea, Gooby. Yeah, I think it would be cool. All right, well, I think that really brings us to the close of the podcast. Um, I just want to thank all of you guys for listening. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. I think we've enjoyed making this a lot more than the first two episodes that we're scrapping now because those were a little too structured and bad. If you would, please go on to iTunes. Give us a five-star rating if you enjoyed it. It is the Malt House Games Podcast. And if you didn't enjoy it, don't give us any rating at all. That's preferred. Uh, Malt House is M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S. So house is in the German spelling. Um, If you could do that, if you have any kind of questions for us or anything like that, I am on Twitter, at Delton Brack, and then we also have a Twitter for at Malthouse Games. Haley is on Twitter as at Squirrely Geek. S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-O-Y-G-E-E-K. Exactly, and then we also have an email, which is contact at malthousegames.com. 
So if you guys could please just give us a rating, like us on Facebook, we're on there as well, at Mall House Games. Uh, go on Twitter, hit us up, just tell us, hey, this is actually kind of interesting. You guys aren't too bad. Tell us how we can improve. Tell us if there's any changes you'd like. Um, we just want to continue doing this. We love games, especially me. And the podcasts I listen to have really inspired me to go on and do this. So hopefully you guys like it. Hopefully you guys want to listen to some more. Uh, and I just, I would like to know that. So hit me up, um, either one of us, and we'll keep doing what we're doing. So I guess until then, uh, sit back, relax, have a drink, and play some games. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.